Constitutional Conversations is a series of discussions by America's leading scholars about the principles, framing, ratification, and implementation of constitutional government in the United States. This series is hosted by the James Madison Memorial Fellowship Foundation of Alexandria, Virginia. The times had changed. Um, it was now a serious economic depression that was going on in the country. And reaction to that was both violent and peaceful, but uh, when it was peaceful, it was radical uh, legislation that was being passed. So you have violence all over the country. Uh, the most extreme was in Massachusetts with Shays' Rebellion. The most radical economic program that was passed was in Rhode Island. Uh, and so these things frightened many Americans. They worried that the principles that they had fought for during the revolution were in jeopardy and something needed to be done. They needed, there needed to be uh, some power in the central government that would allow that government to fight the depressionary factors uh, that, that contributed to this economic downturn in the economy. It was also uh, opportune that a convention was called. All other amendments that were proposed to the Articles were proposed by Congress, and there was the image, the impression, that uh, Congress was fostering uh, its own nest and, and trying to get more power for itself. This was an ad hoc convention that was called that was only going to be in session for a brief time, proposing powers, new powers, not for itself, but for the new government and the various branches of that new government. And so you had not only that convention, but you had some fantastic politicians and some great Americans who were there, men like George Washington and Benjamin Franklin. They were not involved in any of the other amendments that were proposed. And so that certainly contributed to the, uh, the acceptance uh, of what this convention was doing. And then, uh, the fact that these were great politicians, they were able to throw out, throw out the old rules, throw out the Constitution that was in effect, and they understood they couldn't get ratification by all 13 state legislatures, so they decided only nine states would be needed. Nine, a lot easier than 13. Uh, 13 was impossible, in fact. Uh, and they decided not to go to the state legislatures for ratification, but to go to specially elected state conventions Without that system, it would have been much more difficult. Uh, to run the gauntlet of state legislatures would have been, all 13 would have been 24 bodies. There were two unicameral assemblies. But you would have to get approval from both the House of Representatives and the Senate at the state level. By going to the state convention system, you only had to go to one body in each state. And if you only have nine states necessary, nine state conventions would get ratification. So all of those things taken together made it much more likely that ratification could be achieved. Popular sovereignty was an important issue and it came up both in the drafting of the Constitution and in the ratification of the Constitution. In the drafting of the Constitution, uh, the uh, delegates to the Constitutional Convention had to explain, and Federalists later had to do the same explaining, as to how they jettisoned the existing Constitution and started to come up with a brand new form of government, even though that was not part of their mandate. They were supposed to revise the Articles of Confederation. And so they used the concept of popular sovereignty. They were elected, they said, by the people, and they were going to propose a brand new system to, to amend the old system would not work. And they were going to propose, and that's all they were going to do, not implement, but propose a new system and submit it to the people for their ratification. Not to the state legislatures, but they recommended that conventions be called and these conventions be elected by the people. And so in the ratification debate, this, this concept of popular sovereignty as expressed in state ratifying conventions was used as a way to justify abandoning Article 13 of the Articles of Confederation that said 13 state legislatures, legislatures had to ratify in order to adopt any changes to the Articles. Ironically, on the other hand, 
the uh, anti-Federalists, when they expressed the desire to amend the uh, new constitution, Federalist argument was, no, you can't amend in your state conventions. Anti-Federalist response to that was, if you're talking about popular sovereignty, why can't the people express their, their wish in changing aspects of the Constitution that they don't like? And in fact, the most extreme of the states, Rhode Island again, being very, very uh, uh, radical in its, its philosophy, Rhode Island suggested we were not going to have a convention, we're going to have a referendum. We're going to submit the Constitution to the people in town meetings. Federalists responded to that saying, not very democratic. It's sort of strange that submitting to the people isn't very democratic, but they said the, the real democracy is expressed by submitting an issue, the Constitution in this case, to a convention where it's thoroughly discussed. And after a, this thorough discussion, then the vote takes place to accept or not accept. The feeling was the Constitution would not get a thorough discussion in the town meetings, but the town puba uh, would be too powerful and would skew the election in favor of one way or the other. And in this particular case with the Rhode Island, it would be against the Constitution. And so it was felt that was not as democratic as, as uh, advocating popular sovereignty as the conventions would be. I don't think there's any doubt that the single most important event in ratifying the Constitution was ratification by Massachusetts. Up until that time, there were five states that ratified, three of them unanimously. None proposed amendments to the Constitution. That was one of the things that the Constitutional Convention uh, uh, sort of intimated, that you would either accept or reject this Constitution, not make changes. And so when Massachusetts came along, there were almost 400 delegates in that convention. Uh, most of them were unknowns. The towns uh, sent representatives to their House of Representatives, but the towns had to pay for those representatives, and so often the western towns weren't uh, represented in the state legislature. Now the state was paying for delegates to go to the convention in Massachusetts, so all the towns sent representatives. So a lot of these westerners were unknown as to how they would vote. After three weeks of debate, Federalist leaders realized they would lose if the vote was taken. Massachusetts was one of three large states in the, in the country, the key state in New England. And so what Federalist leaders decided was they had to change their tactics. And so they went to Governor Hancock, John Hancock, who was elected a convention delegate. He was quite a vain man. He wanted to be elected president of the convention, and he was, but he wanted to go with the wind. He wanted to go with the win winning side. And so he got a convenient attack of the gout, and it forced him to stay home uh, in Boston while the convention met for three weeks. When it was decided by Federalist leaders that they would lose, they approached Hancock and they said to him, we have a deal for you. They didn't like him, they were politically uh, far uh, a field from him, and they said to him, if you present this list of nine recommendatory amendments that we've drafted, we will support you for governor in the next spring elections, it's an annual election for governor, and we'll support you for vice president of the United States. And they said, you know, John, there's no guarantee that Virginia will ratify the Constitution. And if Virginia doesn't ratify, George Washington will not be eligible to be the first president of the United States. What do you think, John? The next day, John Hancock was carried into the convention on a litter, and he said, do I have a plan for you? Nine recommendatory amendments. These are not going to be conditional. The convention would ratify unconditionally, but propose that their representatives and senators in the first Congress submit these nine amendments to be ratified under the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution. With that procedure, Massachusetts ratified by a majority of only 19. Six of the remaining seven states followed that procedure in ratifying. Without that procedure established by Massachusetts, it's highly doubtful the Constitution would have been ratified in the form that it was.
There were two overriding objections to the Constitution that anti-Federalists uh, expressed. The first was the lack of a Bill of Rights. They had fought the revolution over rights for the most part. Many of the state constitutions had bills of rights. If they didn't have bills of rights, they had rights embodied in the con their constitutions. And so they were used to this. If you look back into colonial history, there are over 200 documents that protect the rights of freemen. And they saw a, a new strengthened central government without a Bill of Rights as a real danger. So they wanted a Bill of Rights. The other major objection to the Constitution was the new definition of uh, uh, federalism, uh, the new arrangement between the federal government and the state governments. Under the Articles of Confederation, it was perfectly clear. Article 2 specified that the states retained their sovereignty, freedom, and independence, and Congress had only those powers that were expressly delegated to it by the Articles. Under this new Constitution, uh, uh, the central government would have far more powers and the state governments would be limited. And, and that there was a great deal of ambiguity also in how much power the central government would have. And so anti-Federals wanted a, a, a definition, a clear-cut uh, line of demarcation between federal powers and state powers. There were about 90 newspapers that were being published in the United States at this time, at, at any one time. During each year, one or two would uh, fail and stop, and then one or two new papers would come along. Uh, 60 of these were in the North and about 30 in the South. Mainly they were in the cities, so in South Carolina there were four newspapers. Uh, all were in Charleston. But in Connecticut there were uh, 10 newspapers, and they were located in eight towns, eight different towns. So they were spread out throughout the, the state. Uh, most of the printers uh, were all in favor of the Constitutional Convention. They say it said in their papers that, that the American people had to accept whatever the Constitutional Convention proposed. So there was that unanimity there and an encouragement to accept uh, whatever came out of that convention. Whereas before, often amendments to the articles were viewed skeptically. Now there was a, a, a sense, because of the news, newspapers, that we should adopt this constitution. Now, most of the newspapers, uh, there were about uh, only six that were anti-Federalist. Uh, and there were another six that were sort of neutral, would publish both sides of the issue. So that meant uh, almost 80 were Federalist-oriented. And so they printed, and these newspapers are usually weeklies. There are about a half dozen dailies, that is Monday through Saturday, no one published on Sunday, and then a couple bi-weeklies. Uh, most of these new newspapers are Federalist, and they exchange their information one with another. There was no national news service like the UPI or AP service, and so one newspaper editor would get maybe three or four newspapers from other cities and cut and paste the information from the other cities and put that information under datelines that might say, if, if you're a New York newspaper, you'd have a dateline, Boston, 25 October, the latest news from, from Boston. And so that's how they exchanged information. Consequently, Federalists, because they had so many newspapers, they had an advantage because uh, they got their story before the public more than anti-Federalists. Now, given that, and most historians recognize that, but given that, you find that the anti-Federalists take the lead, and they start out first with their objections to the Constitution and the newspapers, and Federalists then respond. Well, the Federalists did a pretty good job of responding, and uh, I think overall you can say that the newspapers were a, a real uh, advantage that Federalists had over anti-Federalists. It's hard to single out who was the single most important person in the ratification debate. There, there are a half dozen that could be pointed out, but uh, obviously George Washington must be high uh, in, in that list. Uh, it's a little strange to say that because Washington tried to stay out of the ratification debate. He did not stand for election to the state ratifying convention, much to the dismay of Federalists. 
they felt that that cost maybe 10 or 20 votes uh, in that convention by not having, having him as, as a delegate. Uh, but uh, he, as president of the Constitutional Convention, uh, signed a letter that covered the Constitution and explained what the Constitutional Convention did. Whenever the Constitution was published, that letter was published with it, with George Washington's signature, that he endorsed the Constitution. And so it was also felt that he was the natural person to be elected the first president under, under the Constitution. And it was felt that he would do a good job. He would not endanger the rights of people. So Washington was probably a, a key figure. If you can look at others, uh, John Hancock and the ratification in Ma Massachusetts was critical. If Massachusetts didn't ratify, perhaps the whole process would, would fail. And it was Hancock who came to the fore there. In New York, to get New York ratified, you needed an anti-Federalist, a man by the name of Melanchthon Smith. So for a period of maybe about four weeks, he was perhaps the most important man in the country because he got the anti-Federalists, which were two-thirds of the New York Convention, to agree, enough of them to agree, that they would ratify the Constitution. Other uh, uh, candidates for being the most important figure would be James Madison and Alexander Hamilton, important in both of their states, important in the Constitutional Convention in getting the, the Convention ratified, important in writing the Federalist Papers, which, although not as important at the time as they became, were still of, of major consequence. And both of those men played critical roles in their state ratifying conventions. So there's, there's a handful of individuals that can be pointed out as being very, very important. But I think I'll stick with George Washington as the most important figure. Constitutional Conversations is made possible by a generous grant from the Fairley S. Dickinson Jr. Foundation. Constitutional Conversations is made possible by the James Madison Education Fund.